Hello, everyone. Welcome to the channel. We've got another Ask the Experts episode. Today, I'm joined by Rick and Ricardo from Black Marble. My name's Kent Weir. I'm a principal program manager on the Azure Logic Apps team. And today, we're going to talk about BizTalk server migration to Azure integration services. Thanks, guys, for joining me. Uh, let's do some intros. Maybe, Rick, let's start with you, please. Sure. Um, I'm Rick Hepworth. I'm Chief Consulting Officer at Black Marble. You, you mentioned the name already. Um, it's a software company based in the UK. We've been doing integration for a very long time now. I think the earliest version of BizTalk, since we're going to talk about that today, that I touched was 2006. Um, and I've got the gray hair to prove it. Uh, for my sins, I'm an Azure MVP. I have been for about nine years now. And I'm also a Microsoft Regional Director. I've been one of those for about four years now. Now, Ricardo, over to you. Uh, hi, I'm Ricardo Villianisi, uh, colloquially referred to as Rick the Younger. Uh, so I work under uh, Rick's team in uh, the consultancy uh, branch of Black Marble, uh, delivering uh, Azure integrations or BizTalk integrations. So that's my title, integration developer. Um, awesome. Thanks, guys, for joining me here today. Uh, so for folks that uh, may not have been following along, this is like part three of a uh, multi-part series. Uh, we've previously had Stephen Thomas, Michael Stevenson talking about the same topic. We've also had Sandro Pereira, and this is uh, episode number three. And what's inspired a lot of the conversations that we're having today is the work that we previously did around uh, the BizTalk migration architecture guidance paper that we've put together. And here we've got the content itself. I'll be sure to include a link in the description of this video and go ahead and check out all of the resources here. It's more than 50 pages and uh, definitely a good place to start as you're thinking about your migration itself. Now, just to complement this work that we've done on this paper, this is where we wanna bring in experts to go ahead and have this deeper conversation and get people's perspectives and take advantage of their experiences as they've done this for other customers itself. So today we've got uh, some questions that we're gonna go through and uh, we'll ask, we'll tap into both Rick and Ricardo's brains here and uh, get their perspectives and uh, leverage some of the experiences that they've had previously. So maybe Rick, I'll go ahead and start with you. Um, what are some examples of, of BizTalk migrations that you or, or your company has been involved in and what has been the biggest driver for these customers to make the move? So interestingly enough, I think the, the biggest driver has shifted somewhat over the past few years. Um, we've we've worked with organizations who not just have, have BizTalk, actually have, have non-Microsoft integration products. And um, a few years ago, that was very much the organizations wanted to move to the cloud. They, they felt that um, they wanted the agility, they wanted to better align integrations to the if you like the cost centers and the lines of business that those integrations were related to they felt and hoped that they would be able to develop integrations more quickly and 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 um, update and revise them more quickly by complete contrast all of the conversations we've had in the past six months or so R ricardo and i have been much more there's a train coming because Microsoft is stopping support for BizTalk 2013, 2013 R2 in July, and we've realized we need to get off that. And we're thinking that rather than necessarily putting BizTalk in, we want to move to, to Azure. Um, what that actually means is they then realize they don't really have time to just move to Azure. So we end up with, with, with hybrid, which um, I think actually both both Mike and Stephen and Sandro all talked about the fact that um, a BizTalk migration is not a big bang thing. And the most successful conversations we have with customers are those where not only do they know that it's it's going to take a while, where they don't have the train coming at them and they're trying desperately to get out of the way, but the ones where they're thinking very much about um, parallel running, stage migration, the fact that they've got to upskill the team, the fact that they've got to relearn a lot of things that that they used to know. Um, and so if you like, it's not necessarily that all customers are the same, but there's usually a set of common threads that we have. Um. Just to chime in, one of the other um, drivers we find is uh, BizTalk is 
becoming an increasingly esoteric skill set. Um, like we find, you know, the, the, the teams we talk to, they've been doing it in-house as part of a department for 10 plus years, maybe more. Some of them are coming to end of, you know, coming up to retirement age. So you're getting a loss of technical uh, ability in a department there. It's quite hard to hire in for. Uh, the number of times uh, we've delivered training engagements to customers and then we come back six months later and it's like, oh, yeah, the, the, the real, um, you know, up and comers from that class. Yeah, uh, jumped on the consultancy bandwagon and left, and perhaps not necessarily with all the skills and experience they needed to make a good consultant, which, yeah, you know, you come in sometimes and you find a right fixer-upper from uh, a consultant. So, yeah, we find it as an element of emerging risk um, that they're perhaps going to re-platform to, uh, to Azure because uh, newer uh, and more modern skill sets um, mean it's easier to hire in and train people rather than having to um, you know develop that very deep and specialized skill set that is biz talk oh kent you're on kent, mute you're yourself. uh so yeah some good points by uh, by both of you i think we we definitely see some common threads here like yeah there is some realities about end of life support for specific versions and and uh, that's just uh is part of like the decision is you need to understand like what those dates are and then Think accordingly. I think the the Big Bang approach is is not something we recommend. Uh, when we go into the architecture paper, we do talk about like laying foundations and you know going through sprints and being able to take a use case or a project um, and and get it live and get it live using sort of your underlying framework. So you've got your logging, your security, all of your sort of practices in place, DevOps, etc. Then learn from it. What worked well? What didn't work well? and then sort of remediate, have a remediation phase, and then start to move faster. Um, once you feel pretty confident that you're doing the right thing and you've got the right building blocks in place. And then last but not least, absolutely. I think um, skill sets uh, is a, something that people should be conscious of. There definitely are fewer folks with that BizTalk experience and, and definitely you know, Azure development is becoming more and more popular. And, uh, you know, not to say it's everything's easy in Azure, but uh, there's definitely more resources. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. So, Ricardo, let's start with you. Um, if you were helping a customer migrate, what would be some advice you would provide your customer right off the bat? Take a good, long, hard look at what you've currently got uh, in terms of your application portfolio. Um, because uh, it comes back to how... BizTalk integrations, you know, can be absolutely dependable and that they're left in a cupboard for years to run with very little maintenance. People don't document them. People leave for reasons articulated above retirement or you know, just moving on. And honestly, the skeletons in the closet, you might find you don't even realize uh, how complicated some of your integrations are. So step one, assess what you've got. Make sure also you've got all the source code for it. Because, again, I find customers who've like, oh, we've got half of it checked into TFS. And it's like, ah, well, where's the other half? Um, <laughs> so understand how your integrations work. And I mean, at a deep level, like what are you mapping? How do your maps work? What do they call? How do your orchestrations work? What adapters do you use? Um, also, take a good, long, hard look at your skill set before thinking about jumping feet, you know, feet first into the cloud. Um, just back to my previous point, you know, we find like some, you know, departmental specialists who, you know, been in, you know, doing a great job maintaining our, cost, you know, their uh, organizations biz talk investments over the years doing a great job but they're like um a mosquito trapped trapped in amber you know uh, on top of an eccentric billionaire's dinosaur park staff you know that they haven't seen the outside world move on for about 15 years so you know um i i, I my my bot my old boss richard would be remiss if i called cicd a modern development but you know the main adoption of cicd and the requirement it is for the cloud lost on them and just newer standards and stuff. So assess your skills, assess your real estate um, before you start thinking about what can we migrate, and how we might go about it. Yeah, I think inventory is is very important. And I think that's, uh, you know, I guess a word that describes like a lot of the activities that you had just mentioned. Now, one of the things you might discover in that inventory process is reusable components inside of BizTalk. And so as you think about the cloud, how would you think about moving those reusable components up to Azure? And maybe like, would you have to re-architect them? Like, what are some of your thoughts just around like reusability, Ricardo, as we think about these migrations? So 
schemas pretty much can come up as is. Um, so you know that you know, the bread and butter of your you know, thing comes in, thing goes out. Um, your maps usually um, now if they are pure XSLT one maps with very little um, very you know uh, very little um, strangeness involved, shall we say? They can go they can probably go straight into as your integration accounts. So minor, you know, some minor tick boxes you've got to check for that, like the database functoid, for example. But uh, other than that, they can go straight up. Now improvements are um, have been coming, I know, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, for taking those with even less modification and throwing them into your logic app. But uh, the other one would be uh, .NET components. So uh, integration accounts, even as they currently stand, uh, if you've got reusable uh, uh, .NET framework uh, libraries like your maps call, uh, they can be, you know, just provided you upgrade them to a supported version of a .NET framework. No reason they can't go up as well. And you know, if you've got you've got years of trust in that, you know how these things work. Then of course, what you know, why reinvent the re, uh, reinvent the wheel and introduce risk if you know that given this source schema and this source schema and a map between them, and I know this works. Sure, lift and shift them. You'll save yourself a lot of bother. Yeah, and I think that's definitely one of our goals um, as we think about like making investments in Azure Logic Apps to help uh, customers be able to like lift and shift these kind of core artifacts where we don't want you to have to rebuild maps. If the like the scripting functoid we know is used, like we've all been there, we all use it. it it's, it's, it's quite powerful. It's quite powerful. It kind of gets you unblocked from some scenarios. And and uh, we did release preview support for XSLT plus .NET Framework back in November. Uh, we should have some uh, upcoming sort of enhancements to that here shortly. And then another thing that we are working on that you alluded to was the ability to call custom code from your Logic App workflow as well. And so that is something that we're looking to to kick off a, a private preview here shortly. If customers are interested in that, uh, do let me know. Uh, just put uh, you know a message in the comments, and we'll we'll go from there. And I'll uh, reach out to you. Uh, I guess next up, Len, Rick, we'll start with you on this one is, um, you know, as you think about, we've, so we've talked about understanding BizTalk, having an inventory, understand the source code, making sure you have the source code. And now we've got this other side of that coin, which is Azure. And so for customers that might be new to Azure, how important do you think it is for them to understand Azure before getting started? And are there any resources that you would recommend customers taking a look at um, before they start exploring that side of the project? So <clears throat> the short glib answer is, oh yes. You know, it's it, it's a whole it's a whole new world. Um, but I mean, the, the interesting thing about cloud is it's not just cloud itself that you, you've kind of got to explore and, and learn about for a, a successful project. As, as Ricardo had alluded to before, um, DevOps in BizTalk is actually pretty hard, right? You know, if you want to do CI/CD on BizTalk, you you really got to think about it. When you move to the cloud, if you don't do CI/CD, immediately you're going to be in a world of pain. Um, I I often joke, you know, you, you don't have to do cloud to do DevOps, but you have to do DevOps if you do cloud. Now that's that's a new way of working. That's potentially a a, a new cultural approach within the organization it's making people communicate and talk to one another who probably didn't in the past you know the the, the biz talk guys are off in in their corner quietly well probably not not doing an awful lot because biz talk never breaks right meanwhile you've got network and infrastructure teams who are who are moving forward and particularly now um, most of our customers are looking at the kind of deployments in Azure that are using virtual networks for security. And we're talking about skills that you didn't necessarily need as an integration team moving into the cloud before. So the, the developer on-ramp has got slightly steeper. But the good news is that actually also within those organizations looking to to adopt the cloud there's all of that great wealth of knowledge and experience that's already there that basically you've just you need to go and put your arm around people and say look it's all right yeah it's different it's you know, the sky's blue but it's not scary everything you know still has purpose 
Um, and it's it's about helping people realize how they can take their existing skills and pivot to applying them in a new environment. And I normally find if you sort of couch it in those terms, you've got a lot less resistance. Um, and, and let's face it, the technical skills challenge, you can solve that fairly quickly by by looking. I mean, I'd start on Microsoft Learn, quite frankly. I'd, I'd look at Pluralsight. I'd look at LinkedIn Learning. There's a wealth of, of online content um, for individuals, individual developers and, and, and um, technical staff, you know, the user groups. Um, look online. You know there there are people like Mike and and Sandro. There are conferences focused on integration in these technologies where you can you can start to hone and, and advance your skills. From an organisational perspective, though, um, there are things that if you're new to cloud, you've got to think about from the get go. Otherwise, it is going to go wrong. And that's mostly around governance, governance and management and security and maintenance. Little things like, you know, don't put your production stuff in the same subscription as the development stuff. You want different security on those. Particularly if you're new to cloud, you need to encourage the developers that you've got and the the, the IT pros to be able to experiment. They've got to be able to, to try and, and, and um, build proof of concepts to learn how some of these components live together. But when you get into production, at that point, we've got things locked down. We need change control. We need greater security. So um, it's, a, again, another one of those where you, you don't need to build a three-year plan where, you know, nothing's going to get turned on until the end of it. But you need to break this down into a sort of series of, of iterative actions where you learn enough to move to the next stage. You know, you need enough governance to be able to control the stage you're on and realize that you haven't got enough governance to the next stage. Therefore, we need to go and look and learn. And that that governance isn't just around permissions and billing and things like that. It's around, well, frankly, what do we pick from the menu? You know, I mean, Azure is, is like this great Chinese dim sum menu, which, I mean, our MD loves dim sum. He loves to order from the Chinese menu, which is great for the rest of us because none of us speak Chinese. You see this huge list of stuff. You've no idea what it does. How do you know what you're going to pick? And we rely on him to sort of guide us in, right, and suggest the right dishes and work out which ones we're going to choose. And integration services is, is the same. Um, looking at some of those learning resources, talking to people and starting to experiment because BizTalk's easy, right? You've got BizTalk. It's got bits inside it, but fundamentally, a BizTalk integration is a BizTalk integration. Well, in Azure, I could do it with functions. I could do it with logic apps. I could do it with functions and logic apps. We can bring API management in. There's service bus if we need messaging. And I can fasten all these bits and pieces together in a myriad of different ways. And it's very easy to get drowned in the complexity. So trying to, to work through how you start simple and get more complex is is, is really important. And I'll shut up now because Ricardo's waving at me. Well, actually, just a, it's a really good point. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it was Sandra made, um, you know, as you're degree, and it kind of ties in with uh, what you're saying, as integration services is like this curated uh, set of here, look, here are the be like here are the most immediate and useful tools you need to build most of what you do. But as you is so much bigger than just just as your integration services. So um, uh, I think he made mentions of things like learning, like, you know, learning your Azure Active Directory administration, virtual networking, et cetera. Uh, and he's right. These are adjacent pillars in Azure that you need to develop some um, competency in um, before you even start dipping your toe in, uh, really, just so that you build, th you know, you build things right from the get go. Uh, Ken, even you said, you know, it's like, um, you know your your basic principles of security monitoring uh tr you know like uh, cost tracking etc getting these in from from day zero paramount yeah for yeah. sure and i think the the governance is um you know is i think super critical like just even at organizational level like even outside of the the integration migration project that you might be embarking on and and having that governance in place and that strategy in place as well because like if you're going to get a lot of sort of friction from other parts of the organization, it could impact your project. So it's one of those things of uh, trying to address a lot of those things early. Uh, another thing that we did try to do, another plug for the architecture guidance, is we did try to map concepts. So 
you know, back to, to Rick's point about uh, the menu and and having like, hey, inside of BizTalk, you know, when we do message transformation, we use this. When we use message routing, we use this. And we've tried to map that into Azure concepts um, as well to sort of give you sort of that mental model of being able to sort of go, oh, OK, like this is kind of the shortcut. This is where I should be looking. And naturally, there are options, as, as Rick alluded to, like functions might be a better fit in some cases versus a workflow. But at least we've tried to identify and, and help um, help customers with that that mental mapping as well. I think it's it's also worth calling out, Kent, that so broader Azure has um, two really great tools that I usually send people to look at the the CAF, the cloud adoption framework, which is kind of focused on that. Um, work out what you want to do with cloud, work out where you are as an organization in terms of maturity, and, and it sort of walks you through taking on the cloud and building the internal structures. And there's also WAF, the, the well-architected framework, which puts together a, a series of principles and a great collection of patterns for um, architecting your, your applications. And I know with the the AIS landing zones, the, the documentation that you've worked on as, as part of this great documentation push that, that you and the team are doing, you've got similar sort of guidance for, well, this is what it looks like. If you want to do a VNet architecture, here's an exemplar, here's some code that will deploy that for you. I think people going and looking at that and picking it apart, seeing how it works will, will be a great help to them as they sort of start their journeys. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. We'll definitely include a link there. I think it's a good, uh, especially a good starting point. Like if you're not familiar with a lot of the things we're talking about, like being able to read that in the context of like Azure integration services should help you um, with a lot of these concepts as well. All right, so we've talked about what people should do. Uh, let's talk a little bit now about what people shouldn't do. So maybe Ricardo, we'll start with you. So if you consider like BizTalk architectures and you're thinking about how do you move those into Azure, are there any anti-patterns or something that a customer should avoid or rethink as they move into Azure? A uh, couple of things. OK, so let's talk about some bad, biz talk of bad habits. Um, so biz talk, you've got a big, brawny uh, you know, application tier server, right, with gigs of RAM and more cores. Well, as many cores as you can afford to pay for. Uh, <laughs> um, so things like if you get, a, you know, if you get large messages or large volumes of them, et cetera, you know, you've, you can do things in like pipeline components where you pull the entire message into memory. You shouldn't. You should stream it. But still, you can just go. Yeah, pull in the memory, modify it, fire it out. C cloud, no, you, you've got more stringent limits. Um, like you know, you have you have the limit of your compute. Uh, you know, you, you your uh, if you're using logic apps standard, uh, you might have other logic apps which are all sharing this. You know, potentially you know deliberately well sized um, uh, you know app service plan. If you're in logic apps uh, consumption, you're running multi tenant. Uh, if you know if you decide to like explode the uh, the, like, the memory runtime that you're running in, like, well <laughs> the runtime might just go. Uh, no, stop. Um, so consider. Don't, uh, I'm going to steal a bit from Mike Stevenson. Like he said, buffering versus streaming, and he's not wrong here. Consider carefully how you load messages in. Um, you've got nothing's free, and there are limits. Be aware of them. So if you're doing it, uh, this leads on my next point, which is just because you've always done it one way on BizTalk doesn't mean you have to do it verbatim the same. In logic apps, when you if you you know when you when you migrate when when you re you know take a take a this opportunity to re implement and think about can we do it better? Um, great one, right? Uh, we have so many uh, when we're designing orchestrations. One of the big things about this talk message immutability. Once it's been initialized, you can't touch it unless you basically copy it inside another message construction yeah. ship. We don't have this problem in logic apps. Look, guys, you, you might not need as many maps to like you know transfer things. So again, if you look at your orchestration flow designer, don't think that the workflow that you create in logic apps has to be an exact one, two, three, four, five step match for mm. what was there previously. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity for you to, uh, to innovate slightly. Um, I, I think another one as well, um, Rick touched upon this, um, analyze the traffic profiles of your applications beforehand, right? Um, so BizTalk, it's running on prem in your network. Uh, you do not pay for traffic going over your own network. But let's say we've got uh, on premise dependencies. And, you know, maybe we've got a VPN or an express route circuit in there. Um, yeah, like uh, pulling, you know, uh, large numbers of records out there regularly. Uh, you're going to be paying for, uh, you know, uh, data ingestion and you know, throughput effectively. Um, so 
look for opportunity look for cost saving opportunities uh, a good one would be like uh, debatching patterns for example if i was building it in consumption for example if i've got 10 steps that i do when for each record in a csv file that's got a thousand lines in well do the math right i'm going to be paying for those same steps over and over and over again what are you doing in those steps? Could you do it more potentially more cost effectively in a function? Not trying to uh, you know cheat you, the man, out of your uh, your hard earned dime, as it were, but um, you can you know design applications to be cost effective um, by combining components. So again, don't just lift as is. Look, uh, uh, take this as an opportunity to look how you could do things slightly better. Mm -hmm. um, and I will uh, I'll, I'll, I'll echo one last thing that uh, uh, Sandra said. I accept it was taught to me as kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, is don't overcomplicate things. Best best bit of advice I can give you because um, you make your you know you 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 have a consequence of you might design this beautifully architected solution, but remember you have to be able to reverse engineer that into bicep or you know uh, some form of Azure infrastructure as code. You know uh, pick uh, pick your poison uh, to be able to deploy that. Um, and if you do something very hard and very clever, you could give yourself some uh, quite a headache in the second part of development, which is okay. I built and tested it. How do I recreate it from infrastructure as code? <laughs> Just to, to chime in on that one, the other one that Ricardo often says to me is, um, so again, with BizTalk, you tend to have one one thing, right? We, we've, we've got a receive port and a send port and there's stuff between. And the stuff between can be incredibly complicated. Um, we have a sort of in-house rule of thumb when we're doing um, sizes for estimation that we we have a small, medium, and large integration, if if you like. Um, anything bigger than a large, you're doing it wrong. Can we split it down into something simpler? Because complexity is a killer, and you don't have to in Azure have one thing. Just like Ricardo said, you know that could be a logic app or it could be a function. We can chain these things together, so you shouldn't be afraid to do that. Um, and that will also help with development because if you've got a chain of, of things, then you can have different people building different bits of the chain. Yeah, if you were a C sharp developer, you might be looking, you know, think writing a very complex method. You might evaluate its uh, cyclomatic complexity. Um, how many execution paths are there through this method? And you know, above a certain score is bad. Uh, if you've got a very very large workflow with lots and lots of branches and loops, uh, uh, that can be painful or laborious to debug and diagnose. Um, you know, through our faults. So uh, uh, we tend to say over a certain number of shapes. Uh, look, break it down. Uh, and uh, that also gives you uh, benefits on the pa on the platform itself in terms of scale out. Um, you know, rather than trying to keep everything in a single workflow, you breaking up into small workflows lets you scale out much more effectively in some cases. And I think the other opportunity um, with that is like introducing like messaging concepts as part of it, right? As you do break it down, it does create opportunities, whether it be like scale, as you mentioned, but also like resubmission. Like maybe you need to, uh, you have a failure at some point, you can now inject a resubmission back onto a queue at like the right place, as opposed to like, you know, if you have a situation where you would have to start from the beginning and maybe some systems can't handle that. So uh, I've seen that as a pattern and I've also just seen it just in terms of resiliency. Uh, it's actually a very good practice to follow as well. So I think, yeah, like break that large monolith down. Uh, keep it simple. I totally agree with that. But then there's some other opportunities where like the message box was really strong at some things, but it wasn't good at like what's in the what's in the message box. Like what like. Like we've got queue depth, we've got some other capabilities in Service Bus, like time to live and things of that nature, like so it's, um, sessions. So there's lots of interesting patterns that you can now include by uh, Service Bus by including Service Bus in the mix. Yeah, and, and there's also the thing that BizTalk couldn't do, right? We can do event driven in Azure, and and that's new, and it's it well, it's, it's new if you're a BizTalk developer, but it's an incredibly powerful way of, of achieving both sort of cost effective integrations and, and also um, making sure that we only run when we need to. So we're only only bothering other systems downstream that that might not be able to cope with the load when when we need to. And it's death to batches. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I know it's something Ricardo does quite a lot. Can, can we turn this into something that's event driven rather than continually polling, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, um, I'd one last yeah, thing. I, I must say, uh, I, so biz talk patterns that can be applied well to logic apps. You know, we talk about send and receive ports and thing in the middle, um, and this comes with retry patterns. Make make your ports and your you know the pipelines they would have executed, make them a logic app, make them a function app. And you know, it, 
you know, the patterns when transfer can transfer in quite a clean fashion, actually. Um, you know, so rather than muddying the waters of making one wor workload or rule them all, um, which does uh, responsible for dequeuing off a service bus queue, for example, then it's got to be worry about put, putting things on a dead letter queue or picking them off again. No, no, just like have a logic up, which is like this is my. I worry. I I have to worry about taking message off this queue. Maybe I publish them to an event grid when I'm, you know, if if it's something I'm interested in, and you know, an event grid topic, and that's maybe where the the actual uh, meat and bones of the veg of the um of the integration pick up. But anyway, I'll, I'll stop rambling on that bit. But you're right. You know, you get some really cool new toys in the toy box for messaging patterns, but you can still take some good time on a biz talk design patterns and apply them. Absolutely. Yeah, makes sense. So let's shift gears a little bit to uh, we've now gone through and we uh, haven't recreated the sins of the past and we've got a clean architecture in place and we're running and we're happy. But what should we be thinking about operational support? Um, and, and ideally before they go live, um, what should people be thinking about from this perspective? Maybe Rick, we could start with you. Uh, ah, yes. So un unfortunately, I have to say, Kent, this is where there are some slightly sharp edges on Azure integration services, because now we start to move into into monitoring, right? Um, but I, so I, I do have to say that things are are, are getting better and, and things actually in general in Azure are getting better around monitoring. So um, very much log analytics application insights are your friend, but you need to make sure you are collecting telemetry in one single log analytics unless you want to start writing horribly complicated queries. Um, and then start looking at creating dashboards in the Azure portal. Start looking at creating alerts that can be triggered when things go wrong. Um, but also, um, one of the things that I know Ricardo does quite a lot is is um, don't necessarily leave it to what you think of as being the Azure monitoring tools, monitoring app inserts. Think about a, a logic app itself that that might, you know, see there's a message on the dead letter queue, pick it up, pass it, do something with it. Um, we've done work for customers in the past where we've actually integrated things like the the telemetry and monitoring um, with posting message on Teams. One of the interesting things about integration is there's two kinds of failures, right? There's there's a technical failure. The wheels have come off the BizTalk server and, and we all, you know, as IT pros, pile on and have a look. But actually, most of the failures we get in integration actually tend to be business domain problems. You know, customer A has sent through some complete guff this month in whatever it is they, they normally ship. Can we get on the phone and get them to edit it, update it and resubmit it? So thinking about who you need to send the message to and, and actually cloud gives you a, a lot of flexibility in, in, in how you do that. Um, but the, there's a couple of things I really want to say about operation. One is that, um, again, with BizTalk, it tends to be the BizTalk developers, right? The BizTalk server is left to the BizTalk developers. They are the people that deal with it. And IT basically get the heck out of Dodge. They only get called in if there's a SQL backup or, or something's gone horribly wrong. With integration services, you really want to get the whole family involved, right? Because now we're sitting on a VNet that's talking via VPN or express route to our edge devices. And, and if we're talking to on-prem systems, you know, that the the IT ops team need to be involved in, in some of this. And because I'm a mine of glib comments, cloud is for life, not just for Christmas. Right. We've already said this. BizTalk is one of those things that if I built a wall around your server and then it just kept working, you'd never know. It's it's that old faithful of the there was a university back in the 90s where literally they walled up a netware server and, and forgot about it. And it was just there working and then they couldn't find it. Where was this mythical server? BizTalk doesn't break. So you don't need to do anything. And then you call people like us in because you want to migrate and we go, my God, you wrote that code in 2005 and it's been running since. That's fantastic. You're so screwed because the world's now over here. Um, so Kent's horrible people. Kent moves my cheese every three months because that's what cloud does. Hey, functions runtime V2 is deprecated. Now you're going to be on V3. No, wait, V4. Hang on, V5 is going to be along in a minute. Um, .NET, you know, has a shorter life cycle than .NET Framework. Now in the cloud, we've got to do something we never needed to do before. We have an engineering process which says, hey, we need to check this stuff. 
repeatedly. We need to look at the bulletins. Is something going end of life? Is it going to disappear? Has something new come in that actually would be beneficial that we want to think about reworking some of these integrations? Are there new capabilities coming in? And that's actually, I feel, the biggest part of operations that people tend to forget in terms of integration. Because historically, integration is the bit that just works, that we don't think about, right? Because it's a background process and it moves data between HR and finance. And so long as I get paid at the end of the month, because it's moved how many hours I did to how much I get paid for those hours, I'm happy. But cloud isn't like that. And there's a lot of new skills. And um, learning that you can't take your eye off the ball, I think, is more of a pain for those more experienced biz talk developers who've who've got into a certain way of working and and i think what we find is that the the young graduates who are coming out who are cloud native if you like are more comfortable with the rapid pace of change um which brings me back to that whole putting your arm around people and bringing them into the conversation is the most important thing you can do because the 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 new young cloud native developers can help the biz talk developers with that we've got to keep an eye on it and constantly revise and the biz talk developers have all got, got that long in the tooth how do we diagnose when integration goes wrong and what do we need to work out what errors do i expect how might i report on that how do i plug into my app insights i want to plug into log analytics to to surface what's going on yeah no no makes sense and i think the uh it's I have a bit of an analogy where it's kind of like when you think about cloud, it's it's not who can like get on the treadmill and start. It's more about I'm a runner, so it's a runner <laughs> running reference. It's more about like, can you stay on the treadmill? And and I think every company wants to be more innovative. Every company asks of innovation. It's a, usually a buzzword that's top of mind in the C-suite. But the flip side of that is that you have to stay current because the cloud doesn't stop. There's, it's a highly competitive uh, industry, and you know, as a result, you're going to have like new investments being made. And and I'm going to plug one that's coming on our side uh, that should help. You mentioned application insights, and um, in February, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but we'll we're releasing some enhancements to the way Azure Logic App Standard emits uh, events to application insights. And so folks do look for that on the integrations uh, on uh, tech community blog. Uh, I'll put a link in the description as well, but look out for that because I think we've made some pretty uh, substantial investments or changes to help make this simpler and uh, really looking for feedback for folks. There will be a video on the channel as well that that talks about this. And, and I think what's also super important that Rick mentioned is that in the past, you might have like built a custom logging solution and that was just in the BizTalk world. Exactly. And you had you had your own sort of like view into the world, but now this cloud is a organizational thing. And so you want to actually plug in to like the broader ecosystem so that you as an organization can start to look at these events and even correlate them across various services. And so like that's something where just enabling application insights, which can funnel to a log analytics workspace, allows you to play a part in, as you mentioned, like the, the family process, right? You're no longer sort of isolated in your own little island, um, but now you can start to manage that more holistically. So when you do have issues, um, you can start to look across your services and actually start to correlate them and actually be able to like zero down on what might be the issue much sooner than if it was very sort of uh, disparate um, from a logging perspective. Uh, Ricardo, anything to add just on operations that uh, you uh, want to share? Uh, one of my one of my favorite terms of phrase because uh, you mentioned it. Uh, tele telemetry without correlation is just noise. So heck, it, you know, it, you get some wonderful out of the box runtime identifiers when logic app instances consumption or standard fire up. Make use of those. Pass them around if you are doing if you're passing things to function apps, for example. Have your function app wired into application insights if you create a custom telemetry event send that identifier in include your business identifiers a good one like if i've got an invoice that i received you know um my system processed ages ago and the invoice identifiers then used or sorry purchase order and invoices and you know there's business identifiers that link those two processes together 
log them. Do you know, you know, you, you can you can actually find we did with um, one customer all the data we were logging into application insights and log analytics actually made for some really sweet Power BI reporting um, on like. Uh, hey, look! It, his all the his all the his all the like transactions and like the the values of them that you know uh, that have gone through the integration layer. And, you know that could actually help. Actually, told them directly how much literal transactional value and in the like seventeen million pound or so actually had gone through the integration layer. You know that was low throughput, high value. But um, yeah, look for look look for look for making your logging do more for you. Um, and that's one of the areas of this preview that uh, is included is like the track properties and the uh, custom tracking IDs. We've uh -huh. moved those from the traces table into the request table mm -hmm. um, so that that becomes more cohesive as you start to sort of link across all of the various actions and triggers that show up. And uh, as a result, it doesn't have to be as verbose mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have to collect as much data in order to access that data. So. Folks should uh, keep an eye out for that. I'm pretty pumped about it. It is That's... one of my features, but uh, we've we've done a lot of work just to try to. There's a lot of data. We're just trying to sort of make it very consistent and easy for you to consume and uh, and yeah, build those dashboards because like at the end of the day, you should be able to visualize a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if with with a right mindset to it, you can basically do BAM inside uh, you know on log analytics. You can, um, in which case. You know, for those BAM addicts, they're, they're out there somewhere hiding under the rocks. <laughs> there is a way forward. There's, yeah, there's some interesting things you can do for sure. Uh, so we're almost out of time here, but I guess uh, I'll leave it uh, with both of you. Any sort of last minute advice that you'd want to cover that we may not have covered through the questions? Maybe, Rick, we can start with you. Uh, now is Any the words, time, of, Rick words, words of wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> um, so... I guess the, the the two things I would impart are one, you can never start too soon. Um, like I say, the number of organizations that are coming to us now saying, hey, biz talk end of life's in, in July and we need to be off that train. And we go, well, you know, this could be tricky. Um, and and the, the other bit is don't be afraid. Um, Again, a lot of the conversations I think Ricardo and I have, particularly with with the BizTalk developers, is is that the feeling that they are obsolete, that you know the the choice of new technology means that they won't be able to move forward, and that's absolutely not the case because they've got years of experience in making reliable integration solutions, and that's absolutely essential to be able to bring that into the, the new world, to couple that with the new technologies, if you like, of, of Azure integration services. But all of those traditional problems are still there. And the traditional solutions are probably the same solutions. You're just using a different Lego brick. Well said. Ricardo. Um, so don't go big bang. If you've got a, 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 and if you've got a biz talk monolith that you can't take apart piece by piece, maybe have a look at how you manage your biz talk, your current biz talk estate. But one thing like upgrading to 2020 is very low risk or, or, or another supported version. Um, Sandro has a great session from last year's um, Integrate about, actually, no, sorry, it'll be, oh God, pre-pandemic. Uh, sorry, from 2019's Integrate about biz talk, uh, upgra uh, upgrading to biz talk and the risks in, involved. And basically, like, if, you're on the, if, if you're on the 2010 side of the fence, Going to 2020 is like really low risk. Um, you can use that to buy yourself time to plan a migration activity, but don't just use that as a stopgap measure. Like, you know, you're doing this for a reason to buy time to migrate and don't go big bang, do it little by little. And if you need to make some investments in the meantime, just to make it easy for to turn things off, I rearrange your biz talk solutions so that you don't have a one massive monolithic application. Uh, consider a small investment there. Um, I guess that would be my rather disjointed and fragmented message. <laughs> <laughs> all good, all good. Well, thank you both. I guess what if people want to reach out to you guys, uh, what's the best way to do that? I can include that in the uh, the, the show notes. Uh, is that LinkedIn or Twitter or any preferences there? So for for me, I'm I'm pretty easy, Kent. I am the only Rick Hapworth as far as I'm aware. So if you find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, 
my my blog is is on the main black marble blog server so again if you go to blackmarble.com you'll be able to, to to jump from there and and i'm happy for people to to reach out via any of of, of those channels um i don't have a really big uh, electronic presence i'm shy and introverted but you can reach me on, you can find me you can find me on twitter uh captain schmazer i can i'll post i'll, I'll post i'll post it uh in the, in the chat for for posterity's sake but uh yeah best to hold just go asking rick uh, <laughs> i feel uh, i now need to get him a t-shirt that says i'm shy and introverted because that's the first <laughs> time i've ever heard him say that <laughs> I'm on, I'm, on the th- I'm on episode three of a series like just in, like in, has interviewed like the, some of the titans of industry of integration. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, all good. I will be sure to add these links that we've just talked about. I'll I'll, I'll have to get the spelling of that Ricardo uh, that handle for Twitter, but uh, we'll make sure we'll get that. We'll also get a, a link to the Black Marble blog as well. If if customers are, are looking for some advice, want to have a conversation about this with you folks, uh, you guys are a partner of, of Microsoft and uh, you you do this all the time. So um, we'll definitely uh, provide some uh, coordinates there as well. All right, well, thanks again, guys, for joining. And uh, for folks that are following the series, do look for some additional episodes where we'll bring in some additional experts and, and chat more about Big Talk Server Migration to Azure Integration Services. Uh, thanks again, everyone.